Uh, before we get started, I, I have to uh, take care of a little business first. Um, I have a secret that I need to uh, confess to you all. Um, and I've been keeping this secret now for 48 years. And that secret is this. If you just lean closely, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. I am a black preacher. <laughs> Amen. Just in case you didn't know, I'm a black preacher. So I came up in a tradition of black preaching. So in order for this to work out right for both of us, we're going to have to have a dialogue with one another. You know, and I'm going to talk and I need you to talk back to me. In other words, I'm going to need you to help me preach this message. Amen. Amen. So. If you hear something that sounds good, I want you to respond by saying amen. amen. If you hear something that sounds somewhat like the truth, I want you to say, uh-huh. <laughs> and if you have no idea of what I'm talking about at all, say, Lord, help me. <laughs> Lord, help me. Amen. So if, if we could just do that, that would be a great thing. But let's go ahead and bow our heads in the, and look to the Lord. Father God, we just bless you and glorify you today because you are the most high God. There is none like you in the heavens or the earth. And Father, right now I come before you with my knee bowed before you, Father. And I ask, Father, that you remove self from self and that you be glorified and that people see you through me. I ask, Father, that I decrease so that you might increase. And I ask also, Father, that you break open the fallow grounds of our hearts so that we might receive a word from you today, Father, and that we walk out of here different than when we came in. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Um, we're going to be coming from uh, the book of Romans, uh, chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn there. And when you found it, please respond by saying amen. If you have an iPad, an iPhone, a Samsung, open up your, your app and uh, uh, go ahead and, and look for it there. And we'll be starting at verse 14. Verse 14. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord. Since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, 
each of us will give account of himself to God. Therefore, do us, do, therefore let us not pass, pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and especially the doing of his holy red word. And we'll be focusing on the specific verses today, verses 13, 14, and 15. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of traveling to Kenya. And while I was there, I, I went there with a group to do a, some leadership training for a group of pastors. And it was a marvelous experience for me. Um, that was my first time on the continent. That was my first time being in the country of Kenya. And what was unique about that is that, while although the people that were there, although I looked like them and they looked like me, that was the, the first time I had ever been in a, in a, a, a context where, where I was able to look at people that all looked like me. And no offense, but I did, the whole time there, I did not see a white face except for the people that I was traveling with. <laughs> and that, that was unique. That was just different for me because I'm, I'm used to seeing white people, you know. Everywhere I go, I see white people, you know. But that was a, a unique and different thing for me, and, and, and it was something that I had to adjust to. And I had to come to the reality that while although I look like them, I was still not like them. At the end of the day, I'm American. Amen. Amen. I grew up here. This culture is my culture. This society is my society. And over there, it's, 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 they think totally different. The, the, the African mindset is not anything like the Western mindset at all. And I had to learn and appreciate that. And it was a lovely thing to see. I met a man by the name of George. Him and I, we became uh, pretty good friends. We made this instant connection while I was there. And one day after one of the services, uh, he wanted me to go uh, meet someone. And so I was just standing there, and all of a sudden, he reached down and he grabbed my hand. And I had to think for a split second, why is this man <laughs> grabbing my hand and holding it? That caught me off guard. And I had to think in a split second, do I pull my hand away and, and say, what are you doing, man? <laughs> or do I flow with it? And the Christ in me allowed me to flow with it because I had to remember that I was there to lift Jesus up, not to lift myself. So I had to uh, put my feelings, my culture, my worldview on the back seat so that George would not, I would not put a stumbling block in front of George because, you know, Americans, we have such a bad reputation you know, as, as being people who like to go into places and take things over. And, and I, was, I was highly conscious of the fact that I did not want to go over there and, and force my Americanism on them. I was in their country. So I had to respect their culture. I had to respect their mindset. So uh, when they sang songs in Swahili, I tried to sing right along with them. <laughs> the food they ate, 
I ate. Um, I had this wonderful meal called Ugali. And it's, um, it's, like, it's almost like grits, but it's, it's real compact. And they had these greens that were with it. And, and, and you had to take your hands and you had to take a piece of the Ugali and you had to wrap it up in the, the greens and then you, you ate it. And, and so what I did is what they ate, I ate. How they did it, I did it. Amen. And it was such a marvelous experience. And so uh, what I had to learn from that is that um, when it comes to us being brothers and sisters in Christ, is it more important that our opinions, our viewpoints come first? Is it worth it to... uh, Get into a disagreement over someone, over a difference of theological viewpoint. See, we all are different. We all are a diverse group of people. We're a group of people in here, different races, ethnicities. Some people are from different countries. We all bring different experiences to the table. We, We... come from different parts of the country where they might celebrate, th- celebrate things a, a different way than what they do uh, out west or down south. While we celebrate our diversity, it can also be a source of contention. But because of the love of Christ, we cannot let that be. So I want us to look at this thought today. Because of love... I don't want to be right. Because of love, I don't want to be right. So I want you to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, because of love, I don't want to be right. Look at your other neighbor and say, neighbor, say right on. (laughs) Amen. Because of love, I don't want to be right. Which brings us to the text, Romans chapter 14. One of the things that uh, the Apostle Paul was addressing was he was addressing these theological differences on non-essential things, things that that really don't don't, uh, um, stop the bus at the end of the day. You know, there there are some things that are a showstopper, but then there are some things that, that won't stop the show at all. So is it really worth it to get upset with one another to stop the show over something that's not essential? Amen? So he was dealing with that. So in the uh, Church of Rome, they had diversity in their congregation just like we do. They had Gentile Christians, and they also had Jewish Christians. And uh, this this, uh, also corresponds with Acts Chapter 15, if you want to get a more in-depth uh, view of what was going on at the time. And it was, Paul was addressing weak brothers versus strong brothers. He was dealing with, he was dealing with, um, is it okay for us to uh, eat meat that was sacrificed to idols, or do we need to abstain? The Gentile Christians, they looked at it as, it's okay. The Jewish Christians, they looked at it as, hold on, we can't do that. But the question is why? It was based on their background. They were Jews. They grew up and were brought up in the way of God. They had the Torah as the foundation of their lives. So if you understand anything about ancient Israel, uh, what was unique about Israel is that their, their religion and culture were one in the same thing. You could not separate one from the other. See, here in the United States, we have a hard time uh, actually uh, trying to wrap our brains around that because we live under the principle uh, separation of church and state. 
So we don't, we, we have a hard time, a difficult time wrapping our minds around a, a person having their identity and culture being one and the same thing. To them, the, the Torah, the law of Moses, was first and foremost. And to be a good Jew, you had to follow the law to the T. And so when, you, when they became a Christian, Christ, in the first church, Christianity had not yet uh, made that break from Judaism to become its own separate thing. It had not, ma- it had not uh, made that break yet. So to the Jew... Being a Christian was just a simple outflow or an extension of being Jewish. And the question or the debate was, okay, if you are to be a Christian, do you need to be, uh, become a Jew? Do you need to follow Jewish law? Do you need to do what Jews do? And the debate was settled that, that uh, no, if you're a Gentile, no, you're not under that law. That does not apply to you. But that does not negate the law at all. Amen? It doesn't negate it at all. So they had this, this, this theological dispute over eating meat, sacrifice for idols. Uh, because how it worked was uh, in Rome, whenever the other religions sacrifice meat to their gods. Whatever was left over, they presented it to the marketplace for people to buy and consume. And so for the Jew, they thought they should abstain because they did not know where the meat came from. And for a Jew, they had to, if you know about the kosher laws, there's a certain way that they have to prepare their food and eat their food and things like that. So for them, that was very, very important. But the question is, is that wrong? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) No, it's not. Now, was it wrong for the Gentile Christians to eat the meat that was sacrificed to idols? No. No, because they weren't Jewish. They weren't under that, that same, that same uh, uh, obligation, or they were not under that same tradition. They were not brought up in that way. So, so um, why force something on someone that's completely foreign to them? As I said, different backgrounds can make for disagreements. Many churches nowadays are made up of different denominations, as I um, stated before. And that's uh, actually something that's been going on for maybe the last 20 or 30 years. People move, feel the freedom to move from church to church, um, regardless of what denominational background that church Uh, comes from. So we might have some people who are charismatic and Pentecostal in this in this place now. We might have some people who are uh, uh, reformed Presbyterians that are sitting here right now. We might have some people that are Wesleyan um, that are sitting here right now. And so we have all of these different theological backgrounds that we bring to the table. The question is, Do you throw it out? Do you throw out your background? Do you totally disregard that at all? You can't because the reason why is that your background is what helps make you who you are today. Amen? So are you to just forget about all of that? Cast it aside? No. Now, uh, in verse 14, the Apostle Paul states here, he says, I know and I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. Let's talk about that for a second. 
Let's talk about that for a second. One of the big challenges that the, or questions that the church faces is the consumption of alcohol. I came up as a Baptist, and in the Baptist church, you bet not drink any alcohol. <laughs> Invite somebody over to your house if you want to, and they go in your refrigerator and see a bottle of wine or, or a 12-pack of beer. Yeah, they drive you out of there. To some, drinking alcohol is not an issue at all. The question is, is what does the Bible say? Does the Bible actually say you can't consume alcohol? Does it say that you can? When you look at the cultural background in the ancient Near East, from what I understand, it was actually safer to drink wine than it was to drink water. And the wine that they, they drank back then didn't have the same alcohol content that our wine and alcohol has now. So for them, drinking wine was a matter of safety versus drinking water and getting sick. Uh, once again, when I was in Kenya, uh, to go, before I went over there, I had to get all these immunizations and things like that. And one thing I had to uh, uh, get protected against was typhoid. Because if I drank water that had not been properly processed, I could have gotten sick with typhoid. So imagine in the ancient Near East, they learned a, a lesson the hard way, drinking water, getting sick. So they decided, let's drink some wine instead. But the, but the question again is, is drinking alcohol wrong? No. But if it is to you, It's wrong. Because the, the issue at the end of the day with the weak brother versus the strong brother was a matter of conscience. Was a matter of conscience. If you find drinking alcohol does not help you be as Christ-like as you can be, I would say to you, don't drink alcohol. But if, if it's not a thing for you, if you feel free, if you've got this freedom in Christ, or excuse me, I, I have to use proper English. If you have this freedom in Christ, and alcohol is not a stumbling block to you, drink alcohol. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, it says, Wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. And to paraphrase, it just says, don't get drunk. So the sin is not in drinking the alcohol. The sin is drinking to get drunk. The apostle Paul even uh, said to Timothy, he said, oh, I heard you had a little upset tummy. You know, drink a little wine and, you know, just soothe it over some. But once again, if, if alcohol is a stumbling block for you, don't drink it. And guess what? I'll support you in that. I just won't bring a bottle of wine to your house if you invite me over. <laughs> now, me, I'm not, a, I'm not really an alcohol drinker because I just don't like how, how it tastes, you know, uh, vodka and all that other stuff. My mother, what she did with us is she sat us down and she, uh, when we were kids, and she... Um, poured us off some drinks and made us drink it. <laughs> and it was some of the nastiest stuff. And she did it to persuade us or to stop us or prevent us from drink, you know, drinking alcohol. And guess what? For me, it worked. I, I don't see how, you know, when people talk about all these drinks and stuff, oh, this tasted good. No, it doesn't. Alcohol to me tastes nasty. I mean, how, how can something that tastes like gasoline, <laughs> how, 
how can that be good? But if you like gasoline tasting liquid, hey, enjoy yourself. <laughs> enjoy yourself. Amen. So it's about your conscience, your conviction. And God is such a marvelous and gracious God that he, uh, will, he is willing to work with us where we're at. Amen. So when you actually look at, at the weak versus strong in the context that, that the Apostle Paul is working with, he's, he's actually saying that, that um, bear with the brother that's weak, but he words it in a way that there's a possibility they might not be weak for long. Amen. They might eventually get to a point to where they're, they're walking in the same freedom that you're walking in. But then, on the flip side, the person who's weak, don't pass judgment on the person that's strong. Don't, like, say, oh, look at him. I went over to his house the other day. He had, like, 12 six-packs in his refrigerator, and he was down on them things quicker than you could uh, blink an eye. Don't go scandalize his, your brother's name and, and, and uh, try to make him feel bad because because. For you, alcohol is a bad thing, but for him, it's not. Don't make him feel bad. Or worship music, you know. Don't, if, if you prefer hymns and uh, the other people prefer uh, the, the modern praise and worship music, don't, don't get into disagreements over that. Amen? Because is it worth it? Is it worth losing a relationship over a disagreement like that? Something that is not essential. Something that does not matter. Amen? And the beautiful thing and the, what I like about Safe Harbor is that, is that uh, I noticed that the not essentials, I haven't seen any arguments over that. But what I've seen is that the word of God is presented to be true. And what it says in here is what we go by. Amen? And I, I've, I made, as a, as a Baptist, coming up as a Baptist, you know, I was, uh, you know, things had to be a certain way and things like that. But as I matured, started to mature in Christ, I got to a point to where um, I started to let go of those non-essential things and just to focus on the, to make the main thing the main thing. So uh, that's one of the things that attracted me here. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11, uh, when there was a disagreement over what defiles a man. Is it what you eat? And Jesus said, he, he flipped it. He said, no, it's not what you eat that defiles you. It's what comes out of you. So you have to start looking at yourself and asking yourself, what's in me? So Tap yourself on your chest and say, what's in me? What's in me? What's in me? Amen. So we have tension that's created over the type of music that we should uh, play in church, whether there should be instrumentation or not, whether it's evangelism versus fellowship, whether it's post-trib versus um, pre-trib and all of that other stuff. All of that stuff doesn't even matter because uh, the, at the end of the day, Somebody has to be right. And I'd rather be like the scriptures say, says in the book of Hebrews, it says, let God be true, but every man a liar. So I'd rather take the chance to bet on God rather than bet on my own opinion. <laughs> let God be true, and every man a liar. So... The key is to put Christ in the word of God first and to focus on the essentials of the faith. We must get to the point to where we love each other more that it's not worth being right. So once again, look at your neighbor and say, because of love, I don't want to be right. <laughs> because of love, I don't want to be right. Now, 
What's interesting is that we are to become a part of a new culture. We are to become a part of a new culture. Uh, in in uh, uh, one of the classes that I've taken, uh, it, it was uh, Old Testament exegesis. Um, that was a, a very interesting class. Um, I, I took that right after I took uh, Hebrew. So um, I had to, we had to like start looking at the, the scriptures in the original Hebrew and we would have to translate it and learn how, you know, this fits there and everything and stuff like that. And um, in my taking the, of that class, I, I noticed something because uh, we were focusing on the first five books of the Bible, the, the Pentateuch or the Torah, if you will. And one thing I began to notice is that is that it seems like God was up to something that was genius. What God was doing was he was making a nation, a kingdom, a people that, were, that, that was intended to have their own identity, their own culture, That was based on God. And so what God did was when he uh, uh, would basically interact with people such as Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, amongst many others, he would relate to them in a way they could understand. He used the existing culture that they had, and he took that to relate to them. For example, when God cut covenant with Abraham, he used what was called a suzerain covenant. Abraham was familiar with that because throughout the ancient Near East, they used suzerain covenants in order to make treaties and things like that, and compacts. So God used something that Abraham was already familiar with to cut covenant. But what was different was that usually when you cut covenant with someone, it was to, the covenant said, okay, this is what this party is responsible for, and this is what this party is responsible for. And that animal that was sacrificed, what that represented was if anyone did not keep their end of the covenant, what happened to that animal would happen to them. So when you look at God cutting covenant with Abraham, and this is what's mind-blowing, it says that God uh, put Abraham to sleep and he, he took the, the animal and cut him in half And the blood was here. And God walked through it by himself instead of with Abraham. So God flipped the script. Say flip the script. God said this. He said, look, I'm putting all of the covenant on me. And what I'm saying is, if I don't keep my word, what happens Uh, What happened to that animal should happen to me. But guess what? The scriptures also says that God cannot die. Amen? So if God can't die, and he said, if I don't keep my word, whatever happened to that animal happens to me, what what does that tell you about his word? It tells you that his word, he keeps his word. It means that his, matter of fact, in the book of Hebrews, it says that, that God puts his, his word above his name. So if God said it, you can take it to the bank. Amen? You can take it to the bank and you can cash that check. If God said it, he'll do it. The only thing he requires you to do is to have faith in him, which means to trust, rely, and depend on by being firmly persuaded and convicted that God is able to do what he said. Amen. Amen. So, 
When you look at it from that, that, that takes things to a whole new, new level. So, when God related to, was relating to man, he had to relate to a man in a way that he, can under, that he could understand. And for those of us who are parents, we can't just relate to our, our uh, uh, kids like we relate to another adult. Amen? It, it's, it's just not possible. So what we have to do is we have to adjust ourselves to be able to relate to a child. Amen? You know, some, sometimes people, you know, they're, you know, use your baby voice or uh, you, gotta, you, you have to use certain words that kids can understand because I, I, I don't think uh, uh, my kids would have really appreciated it if I would have, uh, you know, used a bunch of theological terms and things like that when they were growing up. They would have they looked at me like, is that man crazy? So we have to be able to um, relate to one another in a way that we can understand. So if that relation is, if that relating involves abstaining from alcohol so that you don't make your brother stumble or your sister um, turn into a judgmental person, it's better to abstain. <laughs> Amen? <clears throat> you just, you know, drink the alcohol when you by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> one thing, one thing I, I, I used to do is, uh, um, I don't do it anymore. I don't do it anymore. But uh, what I used to do is, like, when I would come home from work, when I used to work in Orlando, I would, like, uh, stop at McDonald's or something like that, and I would make sure that I would eat it all before I got home. And then, <laughs> then I would get rid of the evidence <laughs> so as not to make my kids, you know, upset. Because I did not want to be a stumbling block for them. <laughs> but I don't do that anymore. I don't do that anymore. Amen. And, 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 and to be honest, it also saved me money too. So <laughs> that, that was also a motivation behind that. But adjusting to a new culture can be a source of problem for all that are involved. Um, when I was coming up, I, I have quite an eclectic background. Um, I'm an army brat, so um, I lived in different places in different states. And um, one of the places where we lived was San Antonio, Texas. My, my dad in, was in the army, and he was stationed at Fort Sam Houston. And while we were there, our parents, my parents decided to buy a house. And they bought a house in one of the whitest neighborhoods that you could find. And the intent on that was that, uh, based upon my mom's experience, she did not want us to come up in, a, in an environment that did not have diversity. She wanted us to have diverse experiences. Now, at the time, I didn't realize that, you know. Um, I didn't pay attention to it. All I knew was um, every class I was in, I was always the only black child in the class. You look at the class photos, it's everybody, and then there's me. <laughs> and because we lived in a white neighborhood, uh, ended up going to a white church. Not only just a white church, but a white Southern Baptist church. So I grew up, <laughs> I grew up as a Southern Baptist. I grew up as a Southern Baptist. And so uh, I did not have any experience at all with the black church. So I grew up singing hymns and, and doing things that uh, Southern Baptists do, and, and, and it, was a, it was a great time. But when I uh, grew up and I, I went off to the Army, um, what I found out is that although they had desegregated the Army uh, back in the 50s, I believe, that the Army was still a segregated place. You know, because I was used to relating to white people, so when I tried to relate to the white guys, they were like, no, we don't want anything to do with you. So they pushed me over to the, 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 uh, the black soldiers. And so I had to learn how to be black as an adult. <laughs> it, 
It was quite an adjustment. <laughs> and I ended up uh, starting to go to uh, black churches, which was quite an adjustment. Uh, for one, uh, church lasts longer than the typical white church. <laughs> and uh, you have to be prepared for anything in the, to happen in the black church. Amen. You know, uh, like the first time I saw, you know, somebody get up and shout, ha! I, I was like, whoa. <laughs> or you see somebody, they're like, how are they? And they pass out. You know, I was like, are they all right? Call the ambulance. You know, call 911. <laughs> I had to learn and, and get adjusted to that. But the beautiful thing about it was that while I was making this adjustment, the church that I had joined, they embraced me. They didn't pass judgment on me because I didn't know the culture. They didn't pass judgment on me because uh, I didn't know any of the songs. Um, you know, because like I said, I grew up singing hymns, you know. Um, I grew up singing, you know, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. But then when they were singing in the black church, they sung it different. They sang it, it, it had this like, mm, mm, like, <laughs> pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, yeah, <laughs> while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, bum, 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 bum. Oh, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Yes! <laughs> I had to get used to that. I had to get used to that because that hymn could go on for like 15 minutes. I was used to, okay, once you got to the end of the song, that was it. <laughs> so that was an adjustment for me. And they embraced me and they loved me through it. We must respect each other's differences, whether it's cultural, theological, or whatever the case may be, in order to become one, united in Christ. I had to let go of my identity as an American black man. And I had to find my new identity in Christ. So instead of being an American black man, I'm a Christ man. I see things through the eyes of Christ. And as Paul stated in Philippians chapter 2, I try to think with the mind of Christ. For me, that's more important than anything else. But the question then becomes, how do we do that? And we already discussed that in Romans chapter 12. It's through the renewing of the mind. See, what Paul was doing in the book of Romans is he was communicating God's plan of redemption that was using the church to be a continuation of what God was started off doing in the beginning, in the Torah. To create a new people with a new identity, a new culture, a new way of seeing the world, a new worldview, a new way of doing things, a new way of loving. This way requires us to be conformed to the image of Christ. Romans Chapter 8, verses, I mean, chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. Um, matter of fact, that was read a little earlier for that. Also, to be a part of the kingdom of God, this new thing that God is creating, it's not new to him, but it's new to us. It's that in order to operate in the kingdom of God, love is the rule. Your love has to be right. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, is your love right? 
Is your love right? <laughs> Romans chapter 13, verse 10 says this. It says, Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is the rule of the kingdom of God. And that's how we are to operate. When we use the word love, that is, uh, uh, there's many different words in the Greek for, for love. But when it talks about the God kind of love, it talks about, uh, it uses the word agape. Now, I'm going to give you my paraphrase definition. This is not, uh, um, you know, f from some theologian. This is just my definition. It's that love seeks the other's highest good at the expense of yourself. It seeks the other person's highest good. So when you are tempted to judge somebody, you have to ask yourself, am I seeking their highest good? If, if you are getting ready to become a stumbling block to your sister, you have to ask yourself, am I seeking their highest good? That's how you have to, that's what you have to ask yourself. Uh, when I was considering marrying my wife, I was alone one day and I was praying to God and I was like, Lord, do I marry this woman? You know, because uh, we, we had a, a quick dating and marriage relationship. We like uh, dated four months and then we got married um, and didn't really know each other. And it's been 16 years later. But uh, <laughs> amen. So I was like, so I was like really seeking God about this. Okay, if I'm going to, you know, take this, this leap of faith here, is this the woman that I take it with? And what God did was he showed me Christ. And uh, at that time, uh, I was, you know, kind of full of myself. And I was thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be the one that shows my wife Christ. I'm going to be the one that, you know, changes her and impacts her life. So, you know, I was you know, walking through, you know, because coming from that Southern Baptist background and stuff, I, <laughs> you know, I, I had, had my ways of thinking and stuff like that. And so for the first few years of our marriage, it was really rough. It was really, really rough. And my wife, if she would have left me, now that I look back on it, I would not have, you know, uh, blamed her at all. I probably would have shook her hand like, hey, you, you. <laughs> because I, I, I was not easy to get along with. I was a militant, Bible-thumping man. And, and I, was, I had the, the viewpoint that this is the only thing that matters, and I didn't care if, if I had to chop your legs off. I was going to prove the point that we've got to live by this. We've got to live by this. We've got to do it this way. But to do it at the expense of, of, of stifling somebody's growth and spiritual maturity, it's not worth it. And so what ended up happening is that my wife, she did what the scriptures say in 1 Peter chapter 3. She began to show me love even though I didn't deserve it. She went through a period of time where she was very heartbroken. She was very miserable and sad and things like that. And she endured with me. And she loved me through that. And so now I understand what, what God did when he showed me Christ. He had to show me, he basically was showing me I was full of myself. And it took my wife, who didn't know the scriptures like I did who couldn't quote them like I could, who, who, who was theologically sound like me. It took somebody like her to bring humility to my life. And so now I am a better father. I hope I'm a better husband. 
And I, I also believe that I am a better minister of Christ because of my wife. My wife, she, she showed me the love of Christ, and she, she stuck with me because I ended up becoming what was called the weak Christian. And the weak Christian is the one that is by the rules. You got to do it like this. You can't do it like that. That's what actually the weak Christian is. The strong Christian is the one that, that is, not, is not caught up in, you got to do it like this, you got to do it like that, you can't deviate, blah, 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 blah. Because see, in the kingdom of God, it's the reverse. It's the opposite. When you're strong, you're actually weak. When you're weak, you're actually strong. Matter of fact, uh, in Romans chapter 5, it says in verse 6, it says that while we were yet weak or without strength, Christ died for us. So, if we are to be conformed to the image of Christ, if we are to be his ambassadors, we have to look at our Weak brothers and sisters, and we have to say, while they are without strength, let us put aside our differences for them. We have to learn how to die to ourselves. We have to learn how to put our opinions, keep your opinions or whatnot, but keep it in the background. I have certain opinions that I have that that you will never, ever know of. They're mine and mine alone. Unless it says it here, I'm not saying it. And if, if I can't say it in love, I'm not saying it because it's not worth it. Because I've seen with my own eyes how uh, um, presenting the gospel to somebody without love, how much damage that can cause. And I'm not here to do damage. So faith works by love. Our trust and reliance and, and being persuaded to follow God works by love. The blueprint for that is, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Romans chapter 12 also uh, provides us with, with a, a framework of how to show love to one another. See, the goal is, is to love each other until Christ is revealed in us. See, it takes time for the weak in faith to let go of their hang-ups. And we must love them regardless. And for the strong, sometimes uh, we have to still bear with their, their freedom until they get to a point to where they mature in Christ, to where they're not so free that they uh, cause problems. Because you can be too weak be a stumbling block, but then you can be too free and still cause contentions. Don't let other people beat you out out loving them. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you can't beat me out loving you. Look at your other neighbor and say, I want to see you try. I want to see you try. See, the thing is, is that in Romans 12, 10, it says that, Paul says that we have to outlove one another. We have to esteem each other higher than ourselves. Every day we meet, we need, there needs to be a contest of who can outlove who. Amen? If it means you got to race to the door to open the door for your brother or your sister, Race to the door to see who can get there first. I'm reminded of the Warner Brothers cartoon of those two uh, uh, woodchucks or chipmunks. I don't know what they were. But they were twins and they would come to the door and be like, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. That's how the kingdom of God should look. That's how the kingdom of God should look. That we are out loving each other to the point that, hey, oh. We can't move because I'm trying to outlove you and you're trying to outlove me. So don't let people beat you in loving them. So 
as I begin to take my seat, the final question I want to leave you with is, how can we learn to love each other in spite of our differences? One way that I learned was that Jesus, he came down through 42 generations. He was born in a manger. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes. And then he grew to become a man. And at 30 years of age, he started his public ministry. He turned water into wine. Well, he healed the sick and he raised the dead. Well, and then he went to the cross. Well, but before he did that, he had to go on trial, although he was innocent. And he was passed from judgment hall to judgment hall. But he didn't say a mumbling word. Wow. And they ended up putting a thorny crown on his head until blood started to run down. They whipped his back with a cat of nine tails until the flesh came off his back. And it was excruciating pain. He had to carry his cross down Calvary's way. He went up to Calvary, the place of the skull. Well, and when they got there, they nailed him to the cross. They stretched him wide. They nailed his hands and they nailed his feet. But he didn't say a mumbling word. Well, and then he hung there and they pierced him in the side until blood and water ran down. Well, he hung there Friday, and then he died. He hung there Saturday, and then they took him down and they put him in a borrowed tomb, and then they put a rock to cover it up. But they thought they could stop him. But they didn't know that the, the love that he had for us was more powerful than that. Jesus said, because of love, because of love, I don't want to be right. He said, I'll take on your wrongness. I'll take on your sin so you don't have to because I love you. And then when they went back to the tomb, the rock was rolled away, but Jesus wasn't there. And then... He appeared to Mary and them. Look at your neighbor and say, Mary and them. And told him, why are you here? And he said, whom you're looking for is not in there. Because he rose from the grave. And see, when he rose from the grave, he got up with all power in his hands. <laughs> Resurrection life power which gives us the power to walk right, to love right. Amen. Amen. And when we realize that, we know that we can love one another in spite of ourselves. So that's why we have the ability to love one another just like that. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we just bless you and we glorify you. We thank you so much, Father, for what Christ did on the cross for us and that it opened the door and led the way for us to love one another in spite of ourselves, to love each other in spite of being weak or strong. Help us to put aside our differences on non-essential things, cultural differences and all differences, to become united in the mind of Christ so that we might save a dying world by presenting the gospel that is so powerful that it can change the heart-sick soul. And we thank you and we love you in the name of Jesus. Amen.